Hey there, it's Randy, your friendly communication director. And I don't know about you, but I'm recovering from Christmas. My head is still in a bit of a fog and I'm guessing yours is too. So I'm really glad you're tuning into our year-end online service because there's nothing like worship and the Word of God to renew our minds and align our hearts. But before we jump into the service proper, let me put a few things on your radar that are coming up in the new year. And you can find these and more in the coming up section of our digital bulletin, which is at oakpoint.org slash info. And if you're watching on our live page, there's a bulletin link in the upper right. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link below the video window. Now, January 2022 is going to be a really exciting month in the life of our church. And that's mainly because January 9 will welcome our new lead pastor, John Morales, his wife, Anna, and their children. And this will be Pastor John's first weekend on staff at Oak Point Novi. And on that day, he'll begin a new series in the book of 2 Corinthians. The Novi staff is really excited to start 2022 under Pastor John's leadership, and we really hope you'll come out in person to welcome him. But before Pastor John arrives, we want you to show up next weekend as we resume our in-person services. And on January 2, it's Pajama Jam for everyone. 
There'll be no kids programming, so we'll have a family service all together in the worship center. And Pastor Brent Buttermore will be sharing how God makes all things new, which is a super appropriate message for a new year. So kids, wear your jammies to church next Sunday. And while we're talking about fun for kids, we also have something for moms and dads, or grandparents, or really anyone who has kids in their lives that they love. We know parenting is tough. We know parents want to get it right. And we know right now, many kids are struggling. And that's why in January, we're providing something called the Parent Summit. If you've ever asked yourself, are my kids on track, but you aren't really sure, we want to help you answer that question. The Parent Summit is developed by child and family counselors and will help define emotional, social, and spiritual milestones that we want our kids to reach. It then creates a roadmap and provides practical ideas to help kids reach these milestones. The Parent Summit will help you to press pause on the daily task of parenting and instead focus on the destination of parenting. Launching on January 16th, the Parent Summit is a digital package that you can use in your home or with a group. And in addition, for those of you who would prefer live discussion, we'll be hosting on-site summit groups at Oak Point Novi. To learn more and to pre-register, there's a link in your digital bulletin this weekend. And guess what? The cost is free. And let that be our Christmas gift to you. Also in January, we have new men's studies starting. We have a kickoff for women's ministry and the beginning of our renew groups and our life studies. And you can find details in the digital bulletin this week. Now, while there have been so many challenges in 2021, God has proven so faithful to his church. I hope you've experienced his faithfulness as well. And as we approach the year's end, on behalf of Oak Point's leadership, I wanna thank you for your generosity. If you're preparing a year-end gift, please remember that online giving must be received and mailed gifts must be postmarked before January 1 to show up on your 2021 giving statement. Finally, we have a sizable gap that still exists between giving and expenses for 2021. So thank you for considering an extra year-end gift this coming week to help our church begin 2022 in a strong financial position. You can make your donation at oakpoint.org slash give. Thanks so much for going beyond Christmas with us and Happy New Year.
If you're like me, then the scene is familiar. It's the day after Christmas. You have wrapping paper kind of everywhere. There's bows strewn about. You're a little full from yesterday's meal, and, and to be honest, there might be dishes in the sink. It's kind of a familiar scene with everybody. In fact, you may be tuning in after December 26th because you were just so busy on the weekend hanging out with family, celebrating, doing all the things, opening up all the presents. But the familiarity comes when we get that feeling when Christmas is done. We prep for over a month. We prep for a long time. We expect so many things to happen and we, we do all the preparation for one day and then all of a sudden, it's gone. December 26th happens and Christmas is behind us and we have to wait 364 days before it comes again. And if, again, if you're like me, there's this sense of dread, there's this sense of loss and kind of a bit of a sadness and psychologists would call it the Christmas blues and they would liken it to a post-vacation letdown. And it's pretty interesting. I read up a little bit on what happens to our brains. See, essentially, the whole month of December, we're out of routine. And I don't think I have to tell you that, but we're out of routine. And so our brains work really hard to adjust to this new routine. And then all of a sudden, almost overnight, we go back to our normal routine. We go back to work. We go back to doing the things that we do 11 months out of the year. And our brains actually have to work really hard to go back to that normal routine. It's the Christmas blues. It's the, it's the adrenaline letdown after Christmas. So what do we do with that? How do we respond? Well, practically speaking, um, I'm going to take my tree down in the next couple of weeks, and I think you are too, potentially. Um, and in the next 35 degree weather here in Michigan, we're going to go outside and we're going to take our lights down and we're going to, you know, hopefully storm in a way where 11 months later we can get them out and put them up again. And you're going to put them all nice and uh, like nice and neat, and you're not going to touch them until maybe November or if you're Rick Barry uh, after Thanksgiving. And it's one of those things where we prepare to kind of go back to normal. And we do all these things and we're gonna welcome in 2022 and it's gonna be great and we're gonna go back to our normal routine. That's what's most, most likely going to happen. But spiritually speaking, what do we do? See, here at Oak Point, we've just gone through a four-week series where we have looked at the Advent story, the coming of Jesus, and we've, we've challenged you to shift your focus. We've challenged you to prepare your heart and make room for Jesus this holiday season. But what does post-Advent look like? As a follower of Jesus, we, you know, we celebrated his birth. He's born. But what does it look like to now follow him? What does it look like to be a post-Advent Christian? Well, today we're going to look at an account where Luke tells us when Jesus was a grown-up. He was starting his ministry, and he was going to church. He was going to the synagogue like he normally did. And there's something that happened there that I think we can learn from. So if you have your Bibles or maybe a tablet or your phone or wherever you're at, find a Bible or it'll be on the screens. And we're going to read from Luke 4, starting in verse 16. We're going to read this account where he finds himself in church and he gets a lot of people really angry. So let's read. He went to Nazareth, where he had, be, uh, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Now, this is where it gets interesting because up until now, people are tracking with him. Up until now, they're a little bit confused. They're like, did he just say he's, he fulfilled the, this prophecy? I thought, I thought this was Joseph's son. We know this guy. But then the next thing he says sends them over the edge. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. What a day at church. Can you imagine this scene? And I love the detail that Luke gives. Luke is writing to a mainly Greek audience, and so they would have not like in, uh, been involved in a synagogue service. They wouldn't know how it goes. And so the detail Luke gives is fascinating. Jesus gets handed this scroll, and, and it's the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And he stands up, Luke tells him. This is, this is what normally would happen in, in, in a synagogue, but the Greeks wouldn't know this. So Jesus stands up, reads it, and then sits back down. And they often stood up to just give honor to the word of God. And he, he sits back down, and all the people are just like locked eyes on him. And he sits back down and says, hey, today, this has been fulfilled. And I, I could just imagine people looking around and be like, is he talking about him? Is he, is he talking about, like, This is a guy we grew up with. This is Joseph's son. And then Jesus does something that totally angers everybody there. He tells two stories. And they were historical accounts. They were one of Elijah, where Elijah prayed for rain for three and a half years, and it finally came, and and he went to a widow to bless her, to do a miracle of God. But he didn't go to the people of God. He didn't go to Israel. He went outside of Israel to a Gentile. And the miracle of God came to a Gentile. In essence, the people of God weren't ready for the miracle. And he told the second one of Elisha, who was going to heal someone of leprosy. But again, the people of God, the Israelites, weren't ready for that miracle. And so he went to a Syrian woman, a Gentile. And that person got healed. The Syrian man, excuse me. That person got healed because the people of God weren't ready. And in essence, Jesus was saying to the people in the synagogue that very day, hey, you're not ready for the miracles of God that are coming your way through me, the Messiah. You're not ready for it. In fact, uh, a prophet is really without honor in his hometown. So I'm going to go out to the ends of the earth. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. That's the mission. That, that's the reason I came. I'm going to go out there and do the miracles of God because you're not really ready for the miracles. And they got so mad, so, so much so that they, they essentially pushed him to the edge of town, which was a hill or a cliff, and they wanted to push him over. They wanted to kill him. But eventually, he escapes, and now we don't know how. The scriptures doesn't say how. They just says, the scriptures just say he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, I don't know if he pulled like a Lord of the Rings where he just like an invisibility cloak and he just walked by. We don't know how it happened, but it happened, and he walked right through the crowd. Man, can you imagine? Can you imagine having Jesus in your midst? and wanting to kill him, wanting to push him off a cliff. 
I want to lay out two reasons that Jesus was rejected in his hometown and then pull out two applications so that we don't become the kind of people that want to push Jesus off a cliff. Reason number one, he was rejected. He was rejected because of his familiarity. People knew him. They grew up with Jesus. These were his buddies. These were the people who lived next door to Mary and Joseph when Jesus grew up. These guys were like, I knew you as a 13-year-old. You were an adolescent with me. Like, I knew you. you. You can't be the son of God. You know, the women were like, I play bingo with your mom. There's no way you're the son of God. You know, all, all, all these things, they were way too familiar with Jesus. They had, they had room in their hearts for Jesus to be a friend, a, a son but they had no room in their hearts for Jesus to be the long-awaited Messiah who was to come, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. They didn't have a space in their hearts for who Jesus really was because they were too familiar with him. And so my question to you, and really it's been convicting as I've been thinking about this message, is really, are we too familiar with Jesus? Is he the baby that's born that we celebrate every year, but then we put him back in the nativity box and we tuck him away in storage and we don't get him out until November or December and then we celebrate him again as a baby and then we put him back again. Do we have a rhythm of just being way too familiar with Jesus? Is he he just the baby or is he actually king in our lives? Does he actually have a say in our finances? Does he actually have a say in the decision-making process? Does he actually have a say in how we raise our family? Does he actually have a say in the big, big things of our lives? Is he just the baby? Have we become way too familiar with him? See, the Israelites in that synagogue, his hometown crowd, they were expecting a Messiah. They, were, they really were, but it, it just wasn't Jesus. They were expecting someone different. They were expecting a victorious Messiah riding in on a white horse, uh, claiming victory over Rome, like restoring Israel to its uh, rightful place. In his. It's just they were expecting a Messiah. It, Jesus just didn't fit their expectations because they knew him too well. They, they thought they knew him well enough, but they didn't. And I'm challenged in that. I hope you are too. Are we too familiar with Jesus? And so how do, we, how do we escape this danger of becoming the people that want to push Jesus off a cliff? Well, this week, I challenge you to commit to learning something new about Jesus. I challenge you to read a gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and read it with eyes that want to learn something new. Read it as if you've never read it before and be looking for something that may surprise you. See, Jesus... Jesus is God, and there's no way we're going to fully understand him while we're on this earth. And so there's always something new we can learn. And so the challenge to become people, uh, to not become people that want to push Jesus off a cliff is to learn something new about Jesus by reading one of the gospel accounts. And so the first reason he was rejected was because people were too familiar with him. But the second reason Jesus was rejected was because of his mission. See, he reads from the passage in Isaiah, and then he tells those two stories of Elijah and Elisha. And he essentially says, hey, these people weren't ready. The Israelites were not ready for God to move. And so so God did miracles in the Gentiles. And that's what angered the people. Jesus was essentially calling out his hometown crowd for not being ready for God calling out his hometown crowd for missing the mark when it came to being ready for God to show up. And really, the mission was God showing up and then extending the kingdom of God to include everybody, Gentiles included. And they weren't ready for that. So much so that they, you know, you know, they wanted to push him off a cliff. They wanted to kill him. And the mission is what upset them the most. It wasn't him reading Isaiah. It wasn't him doing all the things. It was him calling out the fact that the mission he came to fulfill, they weren't ready for. And so that challenges me. I hope it challenges you. Are you ready for God to move in your life? Are you ready for the mission of God to show up in your life? And so this week, if we don't want to become people who really push Jesus off a cliff or want to push Jesus off a cliff, then we need to be ready for God to show up. 
We need to be ready for him to expand the kingdom of God in our own minds to include everybody. You know, Gentiles, who are the Gentiles in our world today? Well, it's the people on the margins. It's the people excluded from everything. It's the people not included. And you may be thinking of someone right now. You may be thinking of someone that's kind of hard to love. And here's the challenge is to include them. Expand your idea of what the kingdom of God is to include the people on the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus did. And the people weren't ready for it. So we need to be ready for God to show up. Number one, we need to learn something new about Jesus. Number two, we need to be ready for God to show up. We don't want to miss God in our lives. We don't want to miss the miracles he wants to do in our lives. We don't want to be like the hometown crowd who had room in their hearts for Jesus, the homeboy, Jesus, the buddy, Jesus, the friend, but did not have room in their hearts for Jesus, the king, who wanted to do miracles, but didn't. He went to Capernaum to do miracles. He went to all other towns to do miracles, but didn't do any in his hometown because they weren't ready. They didn't expect him. So we, we are challenged to learn something new about Jesus by reading one of the gospel accounts, and we're challenged to just be ready for God to show up and maybe show up in unexpected ways. As we think about Christmas, as we think about Christmas being behind us, and as we think about the nativity scene that you're about to pack up and put away in storage, I want to ask you a question. And as we close, I hope this question haunts you this week like it's been haunting me. And I hope this question challenges you like it's challenged me. The question is this. Is the baby that was born to be king really king in your life? Is the baby that was born to be king really king in your life? Because if he is, if he is indeed invited in to rule, then he, Jesus, would have would have influence over every decision that you make. He, he would be the one you consult before you do that big thing. He would be the one that you talk to. He would be the one that you spend time with. He would be the one. I think a lot of us want the kingdom of God without the king. We love the ideas of the kingdom of God, the moralistic behavior that comes with it, loving others and being kind and doing all those things. We love that, but we, we don't want to submit to a king. We want the kingdom of God but we don't want a king. And so my challenge to you is submit to the king. What's one area of your life that you need to surrender today or this week? Is the baby that was born to be king really king in your life? God, I do pray that that question haunts people this week, that they stay up at night thinking about that and maybe journal down some thoughts or consider it for their own lives and make changes. And so God, I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thanks for tuning in. Join us next week back in person at Oak Point No Life. See you soon.
stone was moved for good. 